Hi! Welcome to another episode of Vegetables Matter. This is the July episode, um, or the ninth episode. I'm kind of switching over to calling it by the month, because the seasons are such an important thing, I think. So rather than ninth, um, this is the July episode, um, 2019. Today is July 20th, 2019. It is brutally hot. Um, I've just been taking refuge inside whenever I can. Um, I actually called before this, um, uh, before I started filming, I called time and temp. It's anyway, you can find out the temperature by making a phone call and it is 100 degrees outside. So, uh, it's, it's rough. Um, this is a craft cast about my fiber life, um, knitting, crocheting, spinning, dyeing, sometimes weaving, etc. Um, really just about making things with my hands. Um, and also wonderful tools. Uh, sorry, I have some tools around around me right now, so spinning wheels, etc. Um, this episode's going to be a little different than normal. Um, I kind of wanted to do a little bit of a who am I? Um, yeah, just kind of share a little bit more about who I am and touch on the inclusion aspects um, of the fiber community that have been talked about. Um, and then I also had a friend who um, asked if I would talk about like these rites of passage projects. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about that and, and just kind of in general my history with fiber. I've, I've wanted to do something like that. So I think this is the episode for it. Um, and then it is the Tour de Fleece, and I have been making an effort to try spinning um, as much as I can. I would like that to be every day. That has not been the case, but I've been spinning um, a lot more than I had been, so that's been fun. So I'll, I'll share kind of spinning is the actual fiber thing that I'm going to talk about today. Okay, um, let's get started, I guess. First, first off, yeah, let's talk about... Um, let's talk about the conversation that's been going on. Um, I guess I just want to say that I really appreciate um, what's been happening. Uh, I really appreciate hearing people's perspectives uh, on inclusion and the different experiences, maybe not feeling as included, um, in life in general and within fiber community stuff as well. Um, I just want to say I, I really appreciate people talking about it, sharing it. Um, specifically, I want to say, um, I talked about her a lot last time, I think, too, but Kalisha um, from, or Kalisha is her name, Nadir Tani is her handle, and she is from the Quirky Monday craft cast. Um, she, yeah, I just like how much she'll, she'll just kind of take on these topics and, and talk about her own experiences. I love, she, she has like a black fibers, black threads, section where she's really trying to support um, specifically black fiber artists and their shops and things like that and just kind of making people aware oh these are resources and you know you can um, th that are created by by these people and you know you can tap into that as well so really enjoy what she has to say and just kind of the the different the different um, I guess, people that she talks about, um, just hearing more about them. So that's really cool. Um, yeah. So again, just thank you. Thank you to everyone who's talking about it. Um, yeah, it's really great. I really enjoyed listening. Um, I've wondered what I want to talk about or share on here. Um, you know, obviously I am white. I guess that's obvious. I mean, I'm just whatever skin tone I am. When I was in China, actually, um, I remember having a really nice conversation where, where someone brought that up. They were just like, you know, so, so we are considered the yellow people and you are considered white and let's look at our skin tones. And I just remember putting my arm up with all these other people and my, my skin was just like completely in the middle of everything. There were people way darker than me, way lighter than me. And it was just like, there was no difference in my actual skin tone. Anyway, so that, that was a really nice experience to have. Um, so, yes, skin color is a thing. Um, and I, I 
see myself as white. I've been raised being white. I, I definitely feel the recipient of white privilege. I've seen people in powerful positions um, who look like me-ish um, throughout my throughout my life. So I, I very much am a recipient of that. And I feel extremely grateful for that because even being the recipient of so much white privilege, um, you know, it's life's hard. It's hard to make a living. It's hard to to make it all work out. And um, I think, yeah, I just, I, I'm very grateful. I'm very, very grateful for the advantages that I've had. Um, I do want to share a little bit about um, something about myself, though. I don't want it to detract from the conversation. Um, that's that's not my intent at all. I guess I do want to to bring up that there are many, many different ways of being privileged and many, many different ways of being um, discriminated against. And um, there are many ways of having privilege. There are many ways of um, being discriminated against. There are many ways um, in which we have both power and disadvantages, I would say. Um, and this is something that I am not hearing in the conversation, and it is something I can speak to, and so I guess I'm going to kind of venture into it. I'm, I'm definitely nervous about it. It's not something that I talk about a lot. Um, well, okay, let's just say what it is. Religion. I want to talk about religion. Um, yeah, I think, I think because I am so differently, so different religiously, I have kind of learned to keep my mouth shut, perhaps, because, I don't know, it just doesn't really, yeah, I, I'm just very other <laughs> in that respect, and I don't know. Um, so I live in Utah. I was raised in Utah. Um, this is a very religious place. Um, and I've never been that dominant religion, Mormon. Um, in fact, I was raised without religion. Um, so I would say this was something very challenging uh, growing up, living here. Um, and yeah, I don't really know how to talk about it. Um, what to say about it? There are ways in which I'm, and even like I said, like that I choose not to talk about it a lot, you know, there's privilege in that too. Whereas, you know, things like skin color, you can't just choose not to talk about them. You know, it's just there in people's faces all the time, not in people's faces, it's just there all the time. And so, you know, you can't really choose like, oh, I'm not really going to bring it up right now. It's just, that's just how you are and, and it's always part of it. So there is an advantage in that. Um, at the same time, I do think that religion can often bridge race. Um, definitely here in Utah, I think that's the case. You know, um, people can be from all around the world and if they're the same religion, it's just like, oh, no problem then. Um, and even I remember growing up and being at a friend's birthday party and another friend was there and it kind of came up to everyone that she was Catholic and people were like, oh, wow, she's Catholic. And I remember the Catholic girl just being like, oh, you know, it's okay. Like, you guys are still Christian. And I remember at that point just being like, okay, well, I'm not Christian. What does that mean? Like, you're telling these people, oh, it's okay, you're Christian still, so we can still, like, have common ground and, you know, really feeling like, wow, I don't have that. Um, so, and here in Utah as well, um, there's a certain way that people can dress um, because of their religion. Like, I mean, I've always worn tank tops growing up, and I... I would say I've received a lot of condemnation and judgment um, just by that simple act. Um, that's been that's been interesting. <laughs> um, obviously, I have dreadlocks. Um, I remember in high school. So I love dreadlocks. I think they're amazing. Um, this is my third round of them. In high school, I had them for the first time, and um, so so at this point, I would say it's quite telling that I'm not Mormon because of how I dress and my hair. Um, so, so it is, even though it's a choice, like I, I can choose to look more mainstream, um, 
that that's a weird thing to to navigate as well. It's like, you know, if I am just wearing, you know, if it's winter and I'm just wearing a sweater and I don't have dreads, you know, people can just like think or assume that I am Mormon. Um, and that's kind of an odd feeling and it feels good to be able to differentiate myself sometimes. Um, but then people also can really look at me and be like, okay, well, a black person, that's just how they are, but you're choosing this. And, you know, that can get looked at, at in strange ways as well. Um, I'm getting across what I want to. I don't know. I don't know. I don't really know. I've thought of different things that I wanted to say in the previous days. Um, hmm. I'm, I guess I'm just choosing out little anecdotes and kind of sharing them, which is maybe not exactly what I wanted to do, but I guess it's how it's happening. So another thing I'll say is um, Nadir Tani, Kalisha, Curcumendi podcast, Craftcast. Um, she talked about being excited to go to a new yarn store or something like that. And, you know, just be like, oh, wow, there's this cool new place and, and going there. And then when she comes in, the conversation dies and people are looking at her and she's like, oh, I need to keep my hands out in the open. Um, and just like that, just killing that joy that she had of discovering a new place. Um, and when she said it, it resonated so deeply because I remember my first time, my first times going down to my local yarn store. I was in high school. I had dreadlocks and going in and people just staring at me <laughs> and not smiling at me <laughs> at all. Just like, who's this person? And being very snobbish. Um, so, you know, I don't, Again, like I'm, I'm really, really trying not. Like I don't want to be detracting from anyone else's story. Thank you for sharing your stories, and and I hope that me sharing mine isn't detracting from that at all. Um, but I do know what what it, what that those things can feel like, and um, and it's interesting to do that on a religious level. Um, it feels I, I would call it a religious level. People kind of looking at me and and. Um, Whatever. I don't know. Um, also, in high school, so I got my dreadlocks in the summer, and then I started my senior year. Is that true? Something like that. I, yeah, because I remember on the first day of school, not my senior year, it must have been my junior year? Or maybe it was a new semester? Anyway, I started the first day of class, and I had dreadlocks, and I had never had dreadlocks before. I'd always been a really, really good student. Teachers liked me. I had really good rapport with teachers, and anyway, I go in. It's the first day of the semester. I have dreadlocks, which is a new thing, and it was incredible to see the different way that I was treated. I, I did not expect it to be such a stark difference. That first day, I got kicked out of a class. Um, and yeah, I was just looked at so differently by, by my teachers, um, which, and you know, to this day too, I, I, you know, I have people look at me certain ways. In fact, I was at a conference in April and my husband and I were presenting and after the presentation, this woman was just like, wow, like I just, I thought you guys were street people beforehand, but my, you guys just have such hidden talent. It's so hidden. You guys just look like street people. She just kept saying that over and over. It's just like, great, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, but when people do that, then I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is even more important that I continue having dreadlocks and continue, I don't know, being an advocate in my way for, for the things that I'm an advocate for. So, um, I guess, I guess that's maybe all I want to share about that. Um, well, did I want to talk about the feeling of being other? Oh yeah, I did want it to kind of transition into a little bit more just about me in general, not the whole religious aspect, but me in general. Who am I? Who am I? So I definitely, growing up, felt very, very other. Um... And, you know, I just really wanted to leave Utah. Um, yeah, really, really, that was like all that I cared about was leaving Utah. And I did. Um, so I've been, I've always been really fascinated with languages. Um, so after, and I studied French in junior high and high school. After high school, 
um, I got a job as an au pair, which is like a nanny, in France. And um, I've spent quite a bit of time in Europe, um, a few times in France, Spain, Czech Republic, um, are kind of the, the three big ones. Um, I've traveled a lot other than that as well, a little bit in the Middle East, Morocco as well. When I was living in Spain, I was in southern Spain, so did, did a trip, did three weeks down in Morocco. Um, yeah, I love languages. So a lot of my travel has been very much um, because I want to be learning and speaking a language. Um, I studied linguistics in school, um, in college. So I, I am back in Utah now. I, I do really love it here. Um, despite some cultural differences, people can be really surprised. Um, if I'm in a neighboring state and they're just like, hmm, you're the Utah person, huh? You don't really fit the mold. Um, I get stuff like that a lot. Um, but I, I do, I love Utah. Utah is just the most beautiful place ever. Um, and I don't know, you know, there's a way in which you, you adapt and, um, kind of learn to love the differences as well. Um, specifically in my job. I would say my job has really taught me, um, a lot more how to love people, um, and, and really not worry about the differences and, and have really different views, um, and still just love each other. So, yes, so my job the past um, four or five years, I teach, I taught English, English language acquisition to adult immigrants, basically. So ESL is kind of the old school term. People don't really use that. They use ESOL or ELL, or our program is not now called ELA, English language acquisition. Um, it's wonderful. I mean, I've in my life, I've had such wanderlust. Um, it's, yeah, I've, I've, you know, the culture here didn't work for me, and I was just so curious about, about other people and other things, and that's really important to me. Um, I'm here now in Utah. I don't travel nearly as much as I used to, um, yeah, at all. I've put roots down. I love gardening, and, and I'm doing that instead. And then it's so wonderful that at my job, then I have access to people from all around the world, and so kind of get get to scratch that itch in that way. Um, so that's super, super satisfying and lovely. Um, yeah. So I've been talking about it in the past tense because I just got basically a promotion. I'm now, rather than being a teacher, I'm now running the program. Um, that's just been a couple weeks of doing that. It's been... A crazy couple of weeks we've been doing registration and I've just had to be there all the time I've been working 10 11 12 13 hour days and it's been a little exhausting um I do get a three-day weekend today's Saturday so I had yesterday off which was great and then today and I still get one more day off I've just been kind of recuperating from this transition um getting trained figuring out everything and just jumping into it all at the same time so um that's a little bit, I guess, about who I am. I think languages are amazing and awesome. Sometimes, I mean, you get used to just speaking English, but sometimes I, I do just get tired of like having English around me all the time. I'm just like, I just want to hear another language now or try to speak another language or do all of that. So, um, hmm. yeah, that's some about me. Um, okay, I guess, and this, I'm sure this will talk more about me as well then. Um, I do want to talk about these rites of passage. So, um, I have a friend, Megan, hi Megan, um, who, she does lots of awesome and amazing fiber arts. She's very, very talented, but she has not particularly been a knitter or crocheter. But she has been learning recently. Um, she's been doing some hats. She did some slippers. And she's kind of gearing up to uh, trying to take on a sweater. And so she kind of asked me, you know, throughout my experience with fiber, kind of what are these right, rites of passage? Projects of passage? <laughs> Something like that, um, that. That have kind of informed my knitting. So I really was thinking about that. Oh, excuse me. It was an interesting question. And... 
anyway, let's just kind of start with my fiber story. I don't feel like I have so many rites of passage, although we did come up with one, which was like, okay, that is a distinct difference. I do kind of think of before that and after that. Um, but I learned to knit at quite a young age. I want to say I was maybe about eight or something, and my grandma sent me a book with some yarn. And I recently came across the book. It is this. I taught myself knitting. <laughs> You can tell it's very much from the 80s, although probably technically from the 90s. Um, and she sent it to me, and I taught myself how to knit through this book. So, um, and literally I taught myself how to knit. No purling. <laughs> I could cast on, long tail cast on, and I could knit. And so, I mean, that was just really fun and exciting for me as a kid. You know, just like, I don't know, I guess I'm one of those people who likes to play with string and sticks. Um... So that was cool, and it, you know, I would just knit squares, and it's just all garter stitch on straight needles, um, knit, 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 knit. And you know, I'd make scarves, I'd probably just make random squares, um, yeah, just would knit. <laughs> I also did some crocheting, so I, I knit, and then my friend, another friend Megan, a different friend Megan, um, she crocheted, her mom had taught her how to, how to crochet. And so we, w we would do yarn stuff together all the time. And we also did like a lot of finger knitting, uh, making long strings. Um, I don't know if you guys know that. You go like around and then do, 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 do on each of them. And then you pull it in the back and you make a long string. Basically, it's like kind of an I-cord thing, but big and loose because it's on your hand. Um, love doing that. We made all sorts of stuff with, with those. Um, yeah, we loved yarn together. So she crocheted and I knit and then we kind of taught each other um, the other one. Yeah, so, um, and again, still just kind of knit, or crocheted even, just like squares, or, yeah, I just knit like a, or, sorry, knit. I crocheted a couple afghans, um, etc. So, I'm getting really long-winded, I'm sorry. Um, I guess with my friend Christy, later on, I mean, you know, I think I slowly, like, would learn different things. I remember my mom just told me she she didn't particularly knit, but she um sorry my phone's going. Good. It's just a text. Um she had knit before and so she knew about purling and she would t say me she would tell me um you know that purling was a thing and you could do a lot more stuff with that and she just said purling is exactly the opposite of knitting. And so one day at work, I worked graveyard shifts. I just had to stay awake. So I was like, you know, had a knitting project and I decided to try purling. And like she said, I just did it exactly the opposite. So I put my needle into the back of the stitch, went around backwards and did it that way. Um, so did that when I came around back to knitting. So I'm now making stockinette because I'm still on straight needles. And I didn't know about stockinette curl. I had no idea. I just discovered all this stuff as I as I did it. Um, so um, on the way back, then I noticed that it didn't really work when I then was knitting to put my to put my needle into the front of the stitch. It made more sense to put it into the back at that point. So I, I kind of learned about twisted stitches and how easy it is to untwist them, and that wasn't ever really a problem. So um, then I did learn. Oh, you don't have to put your at some point I learned you don't have to put it through the back in order to purl. You can still put it through the front. Um, so just kind of gradual process, you know, still just knitting scarves, but maybe doing a little bit, you know, more like random designs that I would create in them. Um, you know, kind of started learning a little bit more about DPNs and tried making some hats, uh, but I don't know, just like not really... Like just pretty slowly, pretty gradually, um, and then, you know, and I even got into spinning a little bit, although I didn't have access to, to a spinning wheel, but I, I had an opportunity to try spinning, and that was really amazing. Um, yeah, just a really, really slow, slow process, kind of doing a little bit as, as I could, as I was able to, as I had time for, crocheting little bits. I remember in Spain, you know, crocheting just a little cactus for myself. Um, and, yeah, I don't know. So then my first, like, really big project was when I started um, hanging out with the Fibershed crew. So, um... 
I, I guess I don't want to go too much into how that all developed, but met someone um, who had a spinning wheel, got really excited about that. We started getting together on a weekly basis, and she was she really prescribed to this fiber shed thing, which is having it be local, um, local materials that you're working with. Um, really love that idea. Fiber shed's really cool. Um, yeah, local is the way to go as much as you can. Um, and so with that, I, you know, I went over to her house and just started spinning. Oh, I must have already had some fiber, but then pretty early on into it, I found someone who was selling some Icelandic um, fleece in the area. And so we bought, she was interested, this friend of mine, Raquel, she was interested in, in Icelandic. She had never worked with it before. And I don't know, had heard about it. I didn't know anything about anything at that point. I was just like, oh, I found this. She's like, oh, great. I've been wanting to work with Icelandic. So I went up and got a few fleeces um, for a few different people. And then I started spinning that. And I guess right around the same time, Raquel made a sweater. And I was like, oh, I want to make that sweater. It looks really cool and simple. And so I s did that first Icelandic spin to make that sweater. So um, I would say that this project was kind of the shift um, and and I, I feel just really voracious about garments. I think garments are so amazing to make. Fiber shed was included, spinning was included. Um, it kind of was just like all of it and yeah, pretty transformative project. I lucked out because I, you know, like I didn't even know in the past that stockinette curled. Um, I didn't, at this point when I started this sweater, I had no idea like what would be a suitable fiber for a sweater and um, I, I think I really lucked out because I just did singles. I didn't know any better and I did singles which is fine with Icelandic. It's it's a strong enough, durable enough um, fiber that that works fine. Like I, I've worn that sweater so much and I finally just barely got my first hole in it. So I do need to patch that up but I mean I've worn it for years. So um, I really lucked out because I have had some projects where I haven't lucked out. I'm like Oh, if you do singles in a, with dog hair, it's just going to fall apart. I have a cowl like that. Luckily, it still works because it's just a circle. Um, so I have still worn it, but it, it's going to need to go the way of the compost bin at some point soon. <laughs> so, um, yeah, super lucky. But that was an amazing project um, and just kind of opened the door for me, I think. I think I just kind of slowly done enough other projects with slippers and things like that 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 I did know enough about increasing and decreasing that like it wasn't a problem like I can follow a pattern fine I mean I do fine with written instructions like I literally learned to knit from this so written instructions work for me visual works for me like yeah it, I, I can learn pretty pretty easily um, with whatever you give me generally so I'm lucky in that regard um, I guess maybe that answers some of those questions. Um, one other thing I will say though is kind of with this fiber shed movement, I also hear people talk about slow fashion. And I think I did talk about this actually in one episode. I forgot about that. But that was that was really interesting to me because I've never been someone who particularly cares about fashion. It just it doesn't capture my interest. Um, it doesn't. <laughs> just quite simply. Nothing really more to say. It just I don't really care. Um, and so it's been really odd to then be making my own garments because I don't really care. <laughs> um, but at the same time, like it does, it feels so good. And I mean, I am, sometimes I do go places. I remember being at the Durango Film Festival that I talked about um, in the Navajo Weaving um, episode. Um, and, you know, being at different events and kind of looking around and everyone's just wearing their sporty gear um you know just all those brand names and stuff and just you know I'm just wearing like all my hand spun hand knit everything and you know I don't know I, I can struggle with sometimes feeling a little judgmental towards other people so I, I should acknowledge that with with all this other things like I definitely struggle um myself with with being a little bit overly picky <laughs> Um, and being being judgmental of other people so you know definitely seeing that a little bit too but also just craving just like come on like everyone's just wearing you know the, all these store-bought clothes like there's not more diversity than that um 
yeah, it was a little disappointing to see, but it also feels good to then not be doing that and possibly being um, an inspiration for other people like, oh, wow, you can do it a different way. Um, okay, I think that is enough blabbering about me. Oh my gosh, it's been 30 minutes. Boring. I'm so sorry. Let's talk about spinning. So when I last podcasted, um, I think just the next day I finished up this spin. So I I hadn't had a finished object with spinning for a long time. I'd just been slowly working on this. But this um, is a three-ply churro. This is that fiber that I had processed by Spinderella's into roving, and then I've now spun it um, like this. I haven't put it into a skein form because I'm hoping to weave with it. I was hoping to get that all warped up, but I don't really know how to. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't have a warping board and it's a, a Navajo style loom, which I've never done before. And I'm just, anyway, it'd be great to get this on, but I haven't, but I'm still hoping to do that. And it just seems like, because I can just put the metal doohickey in here and then that would just spin. It seems like a really nice way to keep it rather than warping it from a different mode. So I've kept that on there. Um, and then Tour de Fleece happened. So I, busted out a project that I was working on, excuse me, a project that I was working on um, last year during the Tour de Fleece that I didn't get very far on. I didn't have a lot of spinning time, but I have this roving. This is some hemp that I got at Desert Thread in Moab. It's one of my very favorite yarn stores, fiber stores. They've got a lot of local stuff. They have a lot for spinners. Um, it's a great shop. I love them. Desert Thread. So I have this and I had been spinning it on my little road bug and there it is. I don't know. Can you see it? There it is. Still don't have a full bobbins worth. Um, but it's, it's fun to spin on it. So with hemp or with uh, linen, flax, and then once you spin it, it turns to linen. That's People can, can debate when, when it comes when it changes from flax to linen, but for me it is that moment when you're spinning it. Um, that's, I think it's very alchemical, I think it's really wonderful and magical. It's like, for me, I think it's very akin to spinning straw into gold, is spinning flax into linen. Um, and hemp is basically the same thing. Um, I have some other stuff that I've been calling flax. It was really a mystery fiber that I got, um, and so I was kind of looking up, like, how do you determine what it actually is, and I found out that you really can't tell a difference between flax and hemp. So I think the other one's flax, but who knows, it could be hemp too. So when you spin um, with these cellulose fibers, then you generally have, like, a little bowl of water next to you, and as you're spinning, you just kind of can, sorry, you can wet your fingers and... Um, it just kind of helps like glue everything together. So it's really great to do in the summer. I remember last year I was trying to spin. And I did, you know, I started it, I guess with Tour de Fleece, but then I remember trying to do more of it in November and just being freezing cold, be like, I don't want to touch the water. Um, so it doesn't work as well to spin in the winter, but it's great to do in the summer when you're like, oh sure, I'll get my fingers wet. One thing I have noticed um, is I don't like to spin a lot of it at a time, like 10 minutes generally is about enough for me. I can really have some texture things where I don't like touching things and wet fingers can really do that for me. So I'll be fine for like quite a while spinning it and then all of a sudden I'll, I'll like dip my fingers in again and start and it's just like, no, I can't do it. I can't do that. Um, so I do it, I don't do a lot at a time. Which is also kind of advantageous because I've heard that if you do do a lot, um, then like if you're wrapping around that much on a bobbin, it can get a little bit mildewy. So I just do a little bit, it can dry, no problem, and I don't have to worry about that. Um, so that was on that spinning wheel and I was like, oh great, I was spinning on that. And then I was like, oh, it'd be fun to get my Ashford traditional spinning wheel going too. And I was wanting to continue spinning for my sister. Um, finishing up just that one other fiber for her poncho and so I thought mm, this is a great time I'm trying to spin every day let's do it so this is that 
yeah, you can see it. Um, this is alpaca. It's this really dark color. It's almost black. And here it's looking a little bit more brown. It definitely is not a true black, but it's probably darker than what you're seeing. Um, yeah, that's kind of showing. But it's pretty dark. So I just finished doing the singles of this today, and I think tomorrow I will apply this up. So that's exciting. Um, oh, I want to say, so with the hemp, I do like a, a short draw. And with this, I'm, I'm really not a very technical spinner at all. Um, maybe at some point I would be, but for now, I just, I don't, I don't know. It, like, I do like learning and I like improving, but there's something about, like, how technical people can get with it that really, like, pulls the joy out of it for me. And I kind of just like feeling the fiber and seeing what happens. So it was really cool as I started spinning this. It was just, like, begging to be a long draw. So um, this was a long draw. I tend to um, draft with my right hand, and I guess most people end up drafting with their left hand. So that's interesting, um, but that's just kind of what naturally happens for me. So short draw and then long draw. And then I had a great idea that I really wanted to um, get my third spinning wheel in action. So I have a charka, which is um, a style of wheel from India where they're spinning cotton and it's really good for um, fibers with a short staple length. Um, yeah. So yeah, I bought this charka um, from Dan Barney and you know the day that I bought it he kind of helped me figure it out like we had a little lesson with it. I was super stoked. It was really fun. It was really great. And then I brought it home and I have not used it since. <laughs> so that was probably two summers ago about. That's what I want to say. Um, anyway, I was just like, you know, I should try spinning some cotton again. Um, a few years ago, the Fiber Shed group and I, we found um, some organic cotton that was U.S. grown, and we were like, oh, let's get some. So we all ordered like five pounds of it, and we got it. It looks like this. And I tried spinning it on my spinning wheel and had a rough time with it, a really, really rough time with it. Like, I tried and tried, and it just would break and break and break, and... Anyway, so I ended up just saying, I don't really want to spin like that. I, I started looking at more about how you spin with cotton, seeing the fiber prep, and I was like, you know what, I think, I think instead of going from that crazy stuff, like, like maybe that's spinnable at some point, but I just want the way that people actually <laughs> prepare it, um, and try learning that way, and then doing it. So, in the interim... Um, oh, I do just I do just want to say so instead all of that is now stuffing this pillow. It's great pillow stuffing um, So When I bought the charka from Dan Barney, he gave me some um, cotton That kind of yeah that went along with it and then um, someone else randomly gave me some cotton so I have some cotton roving and I've been spinning it so this is a charka um, it has a spindle here with a very pointy edge and it's kind of like um, like a great wheel if people are used to that so you know I started doing this and what you do like you have it people like in India they always sit and do this um, I find that I really like to stand and I have it on the table and then I stand and that way I don't know I get I can have farther reach so that I don't have to like reset it so often. Um, so what you do is you spin with your right hand. This is, you have to spin with your right hand. Like you can't do it on the left hand. It doesn't work. Which means that now I have to, so you can only, you know, because your one hand is spinning, then you have to do a long draw. And which means I have to do the long draw with my left hand. And so that was like, oh! I don't ever hold the fiber in this hand. That's when I found out that most people do hold the fiber in their left hand. Um, so that was interesting. So it's been really fun to have these three wheels all in action and just using really different drafting techniques for all of them. Well, really different in that 
One of them's short draw, one of them's long draw with my right hand, one of them's long draw with my left hand. Um, so that's been really fun. So this is what I have so far. Yeah, some pretty cotton. I think, you know, when I think about like, oh, what is this going to be for? I definitely think, I mean, obviously it takes forever to get much of, but I'd really like it to be in a weaving at some point um, to be a garment. So that is my charka. Um, I think that's it. Well, I was also wanting to talk about wool moths, but this has already been so long. I think I'm not going to. I'm going to maybe leave that for next time. So kind of a different episode. Hopefully that was interesting. Um, I'll see what I think when I edit it. It's maybe just like really random and blabbery, but oh well, it's me. That's me. Hi everyone. I love you. Thanks for watching. Um, yeah, and yeah, thank you for watching. Um, love you much. Bye. Here's a little postscript. Um, my sister cast on for her poncho project with the hand spun that I've made for her. This was her birthday project and her birthday finally just happened on July 16th. Um, and she just cast on for it. So here's some pictures she sent me of that. You can see the gray with the, um, with that red in it is that, um, variegated that we did. Yeah, and there it is. She cast on. I don't know if she's knit any more on it, but this is what she did that first day. Looking beautiful. It's fun to see my hand spun all knit up.